Well, now for our newsmaker, one of the 100 influential personalities listed by the Time magazine for 2020 was Indian origin, a virologist, Professor Ravindra Gupta. He's Professor of Clinical Microbiology and Wellcome Trust Senior Fellow in Clinical Science at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Dr. Gupta is credited with the treatment of an HIV-infected man who is now cured. And for now, he's busy overcoming the COVID challenges. He's led a clinical trials of a rapid uh, COVID testing system. He's also studying mutations of the virus. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ravindra Gupta, for uh, joining us on the show today. And tell us, uh, it's finally taken a pandemic for us to realize the value of people like you, of doctors, nurses, researchers, virologists. Uh, don't you think? Uh, what is your view on that? Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's been very interesting. And of course, uh, great to be um, a valued member of society uh, as a virologist, whereas for many years, uh, virologists were um, uh, sort of rather sort of... Uh, unnoticed figures, uh, mainly because of the great advances that we've had in vaccines uh, against killer viral diseases. Um, uh, the public really uh, had uh, had taken this uh, sort of area for granted in many ways. Right, absolutely. And, and, and do you feel if we'd focused on this more, I read somewhere you said that, you know, had we done more research, perhaps we wouldn't have found ourselves in the situation uh, that we found ourselves today with this pandemic having brought the world to its knees. Yes, I mean, we, we saw in the 80s with the AIDS uh, uh, epidemic that uh, scientists and clinicians and the society in general could come together to really go to an emergency mode to, to try and uh, understand a new disease. Um, and we had the chance to really repeat this uh, with the emergence of, uh, for example, uh, influenza, novel influenza uh, types uh, uh, earlier um, in the 2000s and also with a uh, uh, Middle East respiratory virus or MERS, and then of course this, the first SARS outbreak. Uh, we had a number of indications that these respiratory viruses could really uh, damage our world and economy and obviously cause millions of deaths. And so I, I can't really see the, um, the real investment that was required on a global scale to address these challenges. Right, and we're only realizing that now. So uh, tell us, you've uh, tackled HIV, you, you cured an HIV positive person. What are you now doing on coronavirus? So the first thing that uh, happened when coronavirus uh, hit the UK was, of course, the, the, the test turnaround time or the test result was really too long. It was anywhere between 12 hours and three or four days. And of course, the patient is in your emergency room and you need to know the diagnosis. So we uh, were fortunate to uh, team up with uh, some uh, uh, diagnostics uh, experts re uh, locally who had developed a test for HIV that was rapid uh, and we adapted it uh, or they adapted it to coronavirus and we did a big uh, study and trial in the hospital to show that we could really uh, reduce the uh, the test result time and it made a big difference to patients. Uh, we then did some work on antibody testing because of course some, but sometimes the virus disappears from the nose and throat and sometimes you can miss uh, the diagnosis there so combining antibody tests with uh, the swab tests is, is a useful way to go as well. All right. And, and of course, testing is key. So that's a huge, uh, you know, uh, achievement in terms of uh, reducing the testing time. As somebody who studied HIV and now coronavirus, uh, what are your findings? So uh, we've also got a uh, laboratory program going on. And a couple of things we are interested in is uh, uh, why you get this uh, huge amount of inflammation uh, in, 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 in patients with COVID-19 that causes uh, uh, death eventually. So uh, we're trying to understand, for example, the, the effect of low oxygen, um, hypoxia, as we call it. This appears to be a, a key feature of uh, COVID-19 disease. And uh, we want to understand how low oxygen levels affect the way that our blood cells respond to inflammation. And that could be key to understanding how to treat it. We're also working on um, uh, how the virus is mutating. We're looking at um, uh, a particular uh, escape, uh, how the virus um, escapes or, uh, from antibody responses in individuals and potentially how it escapes from drugs uh, that are um, used for treatment of, of COVID-19. Right. What can you tell us on mutations? Because this is something that is, you know, now being uh, talked about a lot. There's talk of how it's become more infectious, how it's mutated in the U.S. Uh, now you have another surge happening in Europe. And once again, talks of mutation and different strains of the virus. What can you tell us about that? So one key mutation has arisen uh, uh, that should be discussed, really. This is uh, something called D614G. This is a, a, a mutation in the, um, in the outer spike uh, or the protein which uh, is a, responsible for attaching itself to our human cells in our throat and nose. So this is a really important protein um, because 
Uh, it is the first uh, in interaction between the virus and us. Um, and we've noticed that uh, a mutation uh, has um, emerged and it has taken over the world in terms of the strains. So before, uh, there, was, uh, uh, there were no cases of this mutation. And now in the UK, for example, more than 90% of all the infections are with this mutation. And this has happened all around the world. So um, a number of key um, laboratory papers by groups around the world have shown that this mutation probably increases the infectiousness of the virus, although it does not necessarily increase um, the, how, how dangerous it is for the individual. So it probably increases the infection and increases transmission, uh, which explains why it has taken over the, the old type. Um, but we really need to understand these mutations better. And of course, we need to know whether our tests will pick up this mutation. Uh, we've shown in our laboratory that um, antibody tests are able to pick up this mutation, uh, um, but also understanding the further consequences of other mutations in the virus. All right. And what is your view on the vaccine? That's the question. You know, everybody's being asked, when do you expect a vaccine uh, in place for coronavirus? Well, vaccines are, uh, are critically important. And of course, vaccines will need to cover the possibility of having these uh, particular mutations occurring in the virus. So we'll need to be quite clever in the way we design vaccines. Um, the, the ones which are being developed right now um, may be efficacious. Uh, we don't know. So we will take time to find out whether they do protect against infection. Uh, and in my belief is that until we do understand this, we should not be distributing them because uh, the damage done by distributing ineffective vaccines will outweigh uh, getting them out earlier, I think. And we do need to wait until we have uh, proper scientific evidence of which vaccines are working, because, of course, there are at least eight different vaccines in, cl in clinical trials globally, and we should be really going for the most promising ones. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vrindra Gupta, for speaking uh, to us here at NDTV.